Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of Invincible Season 2 Episode 4 titled It's Been a While, which is what Nolan said to Mark at the end of last episode, and also what we will be saying when they air the rest of Season 2, which isn't set to be released until early 2024. At that point, I'm gonna have a kid. And yeah, this episode made me terrified of all father-child relationships. Happy Thanksgiving! Let's break down for all the Easter eggs, animation details, and deeper layers of meaning that you might have missed. We open on the events of the Season 1 finale, where Nolan is looking at his bloody hands after beating Mark almost to death. The scene is replayed exactly, except now notice the sound mix on certain things is cranked up. Mark's shuddering gasps for breath, the sound of the blood dripping on the rocks, Nolan's cape flapping in the wind, and Mark's childlike, Dad? They are all louder than they were when we first saw this scene. Dad? Dad? That is because we are hearing it from Nolan's perspective. Not only does as a Viltrumite he have heightened hearing, in this moment everything is standing out to him as he reckons with what he has done. He has been stung with something he's never felt before. That thing? is love. As Nolan flies out of the atmosphere, Mark's blood burns off of his suit and from his face like he is desperate to cleanse himself of this love thing. And included in that cleanse, leaving behind in Earth's orbit, a couple teardrops floating in space. That teardrop fills the frame, cleansing us as we stay on Nolan. And we see the events of the aforementioned while of the past year. The song playing is Avalanche, which was originally by Leonard Cohen, but it's sung here by Nick Cave. Cave had actually recorded a version of this in 1984 with his band Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds, and in that version, he was much more defiant. His voice had a hard, mocking quality, but he re-recorded it solo 31 years later in 2015, and the result was this more lonely and more reflective version that we hear. There have been many interpretations of the meaning behind Avalanche over the years, that it's a song about a spiritual struggle and redemption, or that it's a metaphor for the end of a relationship. But I think that what it represents here is a godlike figure, Nolan, who thinks that he has no real need for the love and worship bestowed upon him. In fact, there's almost a resentment or disdain in the lyrics. He does not ask for your company, not at the center of the world. By the end of the song, that figure discovers that not only did he need it, but that now that it's gone, he misses it. I have begun to long for you, I who have no greed. I have begun to ask for you, I who have no need. Nolan thought for all these years that he knew his mission. He was in control and that his family was mainly for show, pets. He was a strong one and they needed him more than he needed them, but having them taken away, now he feels purposeless and he doesn't know who he is without their love. And he feels the very human emotion of longing. We see Nolan flying away from Earth and through the vastness of space, he goes from this ramrod straight posture and the straight flight path to a more hunched or hunchbacked bedraggled path. You can tell he's no longer flying as fast as he can because of how his cape just sort of lazily billows instead of sticking straight out behind him. Even though, you know, there is no wind in space and his cape is like part of his suit, but I guess the cape would be like tugged behind him. Don't ask me how forces work in space. But yeah, our man's got a decent amount of facial hair now. We see him sitting on a cliff of some unknown and seemingly uninhabited planet with two suns. One big sun, one small sun, reminding him of course of himself and Mark. And you can see one set of footprints behind him meaning he is set down on this planet and has been walking its lonely surface. Then he flies by this destroyed planet or moon that's emitting blue light from the center of it, then by what looks like a star in the midst of going supernova, then by this beautiful space aurora borealis looking thing, a kind of nebula. Sometime later, he looks at the event horizon of a black hole, and it has the same design as the black hole that they created for the movie Interstellar. As Nolan lets the gravitational pull start to suck him in, the only thing that stops him from killing himself is a crashing Thraxen ship, appearing at first like a star from the heavens. Nolan intervenes before it starts to hit the black hole and saves its occupants, four of them, which at first kind of seemed like a kind of Thraxen Fantastic Four. But notice how this youngest is a girl, and since the average Thraxen lifespan is a year and they age super fast, this is Andressa, the Thraxen that Nolan marries, which is kind of gross. Her adult form even wears the same outfit that she wears as a girl. And I just realized that this is Nolan staring at a black hole, borrowing the same designs from Christopher Nolan's black hole. So Nolan wants to leave Thraxa, but they convince him to stay, and we transition back to the present with his hand still outstretched to Mark. Yes, this whole opening sequence is very similar to one from another Robert Kirkman property, The Walking Dead, season four, episode six, Live Bait, which follows the governor's loss of hope and his redemption montage that showed us what happened to him after he massacred most of his followers and was abandoned by the rest. At the end of that sequence, the governor found new purpose when he rescued a woman and her daughter from some walkers. They examined whether people can come back from the worst things that they've done. And given how that all ended for the governor, I don't have a ton of hope for Nolan's future. Mark clenches his fist. Nolan does the same. Now look, Mark is dressed in his his invincible suit and Nolan is wearing a variation of his Omni-Man suit with the trappings of the Thrax and Monarch, so they aren't reuniting as themselves as father and son, but really as their superhero alter egos who have different obligations than just family. Mark takes
takes off his mask and he tries to make his dad flinch, causing a puff of wind to push Nolan's cape. But then he cannot help it. He launches himself at his dad to give him a hug. And while it seems like a loving gesture, remember, this love is a poisoned stinger for Nolan. He doesn't know what to do with this kind of thing. But then Mark takes a moment to process and he realizes that his dad totally lied to him to get him here. And of course, remembers when he called his mom a pet and killed thousands of people. And yeah, he's pissed. He only agrees to stay and hear his dad out when Nolan insists that the Thraxans do need his help. Nolan is playing on his empathy. And can I just take a moment to say how great it is to hear a character say F you so many times repeatedly in a superhero genre? Like I want to hear characters in the MCU say this to each other. And I just love in this very R-rated show, we get to just hear characters speak honestly to each other as they would. Now Mark has to watch his dad tongue kiss and dress up, which is straight out of the comics. And then we get this reveal. Mark. Welcome to our home. My husband's told me so much about you. And dress up. And he doesn't even have time to wrap his mind around it because the hits just keep on coming. This is your little brother. You gotta be- Yeah, we get the invincible title cutting off the curse word for the first time, but it actually cuts back and Mark continues what he was saying. F kidding me. Okay, now we see Debbie, who's still walking alone after Theo told her not to come back to the Spouses of Superhero Support Group last episode. She gets her own wandering montage with the exact same kind of storyboarding that we saw with Nolan. Debbie's background is changing as she moves from the left to the right. Now, she was walking all night. At some point, she discarded her shoes. She is looking rough. The music we hear is Olympus by Blonde Shell. It's a song that examines an unhealthy relationship, comparing it to an addiction. Debbie walks down an empty street, by some empty swings, through an empty, unhoused encampment before the city starts to wake up. Her version of considering throwing herself into a black hole happens when she is standing on an overpass watching the traffic below her. We really do think for a second that she might jump, but unlike her husband, there isn't a crashing ship to distract her. Instead, she moves on and goes to Nolan's grave, which obviously has no body in it. So even in this, she's alone, wondering why did he even take the time to bring her on as a pet? Why not just take the planet? So we cut briefly to the Maulers, the scarred one having created a new clone. And this time it's clear who the clone is and who the original is. But remember back in season one, they said that it never ends well when they have that knowledge. We had to make it seamless. Otherwise one of us knows he's the clone and that never ends well. Actually later, the mid credit scene shows a new Mahler clone poisoning the scarred Mahler with a microtoxin, returning things to the status quo. Donald comes looking for answers about what happened to him at the end of season one, and he finds his old glasses in the rubble of the house across the street. Back on Thraxon, Nolan tries to convince Mark that he didn't replace him or his mom. It's kind of hard to tell how much of this is Nolan being genuine, how much is just more manipulation. Like when he tells Mark that the Viltrumite rules of interbreeding are very specific and that they'll come to kill this baby, that's obviously true. Still, this is something that he knew before he had a kid with a Thraxon and he's once again relying on Mark's empathy to help him clean up a mess that he created. Three Viltrumites show up. These are the same three that beat Alan almost to death last episode, and they don't even check to see if Nolan is there. They just start crashing into buildings, and yeah, they're assholes. Raycon's everyday earbuds have been a staple of my leaving the house kit for years. The sound quality and the noise isolating are just such a step up from the other earbuds I've tried that I keep coming back to them every time I need to run to the coffee shop or the grocery store or anywhere, really. You really should pick up a pair either for yourself or as a gift for the audio lover in your life. And right now is a perfect time to do so because Raycon has Black Friday and Cyber Monday promotions across their entire site with select products up to 50% off. Raycon is also offering limited time bundles. The fitness audio kit includes fitness earbuds and headphones and the everyday audio kit includes the everyday earbuds and headphones or you can mix and match any three Raycon products and colors to build your own bundle. These specials are only available for one week. So make sure to shop by November 27th. If you already got a pair of earbuds, check out Raycon new home and power tech like their faucet filter and magic 180 cable shop raycon's black friday and cyber monday sales for their biggest holiday discounts yet go to buyraycon.com slash new rockstars to get up to 50 percent off site-wide meanwhile kill cannon that's the villain we saw in season one who has a laser cannon for an arm he tries to rob the robot's energy sphere from the guardians of the globe headquarters eve stops him she kicks his ass on this bridge even though she's trying not to let innocent people get caught in the crossfire this older couple's car falls over the bridge into the water. Eve manages to take out Kill Cannon and bring the couple up from the surface as the ambulances arrive, but it's not clear if they are alive as Eve just asks, are they okay? Please just help them. She's thinking about the last time she tried to help people at City Park that she built that collapsed and injured those people. Mark brings Andressa and his half brother to a cave hidden in the mountainside and gets to know the dad's new wife a bit. He learns that the Thraxan lifespan is only one year and Nolan's genes slowed his half brother's aging, but they're still way ahead of where a human baby would be. Now, spoiler warning about the future 
feature this character in the comics. In the comics, this baby later picks the name of Oliver and he goes on to become the superhero Kid Omni-Man. Now, despite the fact that Nolan was hurt and closed up when Andressa met him, she fell in love with him anyway before she knew about Mark or his mom. And again, just reminding, she was a little girl when she met him. Nolan? Nolan! Right as she's about to finish telling Mark how much his dad loves him, they are found by the Viltrumite Lucan, who also rocks a mustache. What is it about these guys and their stashes? Lucan finds Andressa and the kid under a rock and considers some bugs. Mark fights him, and Lucan just uses a single finger to shove Mark into the ground. Nolan slices Lucan in the gut with his hand, a move that we saw him do before when he chopped off the Immortal's head in season one, and yeah, uh, most of the Guardians of the Globe in the very first episode of the series. And remember, Nolan from a different dimension used the same chop to take off the Immortal's arm and his head in the first episode of this season. Then Nolan impales Lucan with a stalactite, and given that we find out later that he survived this, it shows us how insanely resilient the Viltrumites are. Debbie turns one of her Korean wedding ducks away from the other. Korean wedding ducks represent family, peace, and fidelity, and when facing one another, happiness is in the home, so it makes sense why she would want them facing apart. She flips through her family photo album, but luckily Art drops by, and she finally has someone to talk to. He says that he always thought she was a strong one. You, you've got strength. Living with Nolan, standing up to him, raising Mark the way you did. Hell, you're the real reason we're all still alive and not slaves or worse. He credits Debbie, not Nolan, with Mark's good qualities, and he adds that she made things work without him, and says, you don't need the bum, you never did. Remember, earlier during their respective montages, Nolan had given up and was ready to throw himself into that black hole. The only thing that stopped him was this hero complex. But when Debbie looks out over the traffic, nothing was there to stop her. She had to decide just for herself not to jump, despite everything. She didn't need a kind of outside influence or a hero complex or some kind of like distraction coming into her periphery. She is stronger than he is. So in a way, the fact that she has empathy, the fact that she feels guilt for everything her husband did and has to live with that guilt without having the luxury of being a psychopath makes her far stronger than he is. Meanwhile, Donald logs onto the servers using Cecil's login and password. No idea how he has that information and he finds footage of his own death. Later, when he tries to cut himself, the knife bends. There's a lot going on with Donald, and it seemed a bit easy that he made this discovery. I'm just wondering if it's possible that someone wanted Donald to figure things out, or maybe this is just a cycle that has happened to him before. Mark and Nolan see scores of dead Thraxons, and Nolan reacts. Why do I care about them? I'm not supposed to feel this way. How is this? Better. It's just great voice acting from J.K. Simmons. Mark tells him that this is how he should have felt on Earth. And that really hits home for Nolan. He chokes Mark throughout this rant, which is just, you know, horribly violent, but interesting that he blames Mark for imbuing him with this empathy. It's something that hurts him and he has no other defense to it. The other two Vulturemites arrive and Mark tries to talk to the female who has this long braid with the knife attached to the end of it. Pretty sure this is Thula from the comics. She tells him that she will make it quick since he's Nolan's son. And at first, Mark is absolutely outmatched. Nolan tells him to stop holding back, but Mark doesn't want to kill people. But upon seeing the dead Thraxons and being reminded of all the people whose blood is still on his hands, he begins to bring it. So here we intercut. Mark versus Thula, Nolan versus the other, and the these fights are bloody. Actually, one insert shows Mark jabbing his fingers into Thula's throat, like the Neo versus the Agent fight in the Matrix. Nolan cracks the male's skull. It smushes it so that the eyes are misaligned. Yet still, this guy is briefly alive trying to smush it back together. Viltrumites made a tough stuff. Uh, how? How? Mark hesitates, and Thula takes this opportunity to stab him with her hair knife. And Mark, in a moment of childlike vulnerability, calls for his dad, who intervenes and punches Thula's jaw off. And it's one of the most gruesome deaths we've seen on the show, which is saying a lot, but it might just be her trembling hands or her twitching eye or the coughing sounds that she makes. Lucan returns, literally holding his intestines with his hands by bunching up and swallowing up his clothes. He breaks Nolan's back with a flying kick. We hear all the bones cracking and then says, it's done into a communication device, and this time both Mark and Nolan are left bleeding on the rocks. Other Viltrumites arrive and take Lucan and Nolan away, and Nolan tells Mark not to forget the good he did and the books that he wrote. And we meet General Krieg, who's a huge character from the comics. Here he's voiced by Clancy Brown, telling Mark that his fighting performance has proven him worthy of his Viltrumite heritage. Nolan will be executed, he says, but Mark is to return to Earth to take up Nolan's mission to prepare Earth and its people for a Viltrumite takeover. If he doesn't succeed, the Viltrumites will kill millions. Debbie tells Cecil that she doesn't want the money from Nolan's books anymore and to give that money to the survivors in Chicago. They need it more. Now these books include Savage Planet, Savage Beasts, 
and the man with the invincible gun. On the covers, we see a younger Nolan with that female Viltrumite that accompanied him in the flashbacks with Alan the Alien's home planet with the Unopens and Viltrum's massacre of them. Now, Nolan's books are from Invincible number 35 from 2006, and they're probably gonna play a big role in the second half of the season. So if you haven't read the comics and you don't wanna be spoiled, feel free to stop watching now and I'll see you in 2024. The man with the invincible gun tells the story of a legendary alien named Space Rider, AKA Space Racer, who carries a gun called the Infinity Ray that was unstoppable and goes through anything, planets, stars, and even Viltrumites. Nolan had fought this guy and he caused him to drop this gun on an asteroid belt and there that gun had stayed. I wonder actually if this ray is what Angstrom Levy was trying to build in that alternate reality in the season premiere. Meanwhile, Savage Planet Savage Beasts is about the Ragnar and how their planet's gravity made them super strong and capable of injuring Nolan with ease, causing him tremendous pain despite their small size. While Omni-Man sold these stories as if they were fictional tales, they are actually true accounts. And Nolan leaves in these books a message for Mark about Viltrumite weaknesses. It's a pretty great turn in the comics and I just love to see it here as a message to consumers of comic-based media like this, that the greatest truths are in the pages of the source material. So read, children, read! And that is it for part one of season two of Invincible. I can't wait for the show to come back next year. In the meantime, please support us by grabbing a shirt from nerdriot.shop, subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network, follow me on all socials at EA Voss. Big thanks to Gina Ibolito for writing this breakdown. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.